Today we're reading from one of the eyewitness accounts of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I love that no one in any church today across the world celebrating Easter has to take some preacher's word for it. Today we are looking at eyewitness accounts of the death of Jesus. The one that we're looking at today is his friend Matthew, who was one of the close followers of Jesus and who gives us this account of Jesus on the cross in the last hours of his life. This is what we find in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 45. Matthew records that from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. And about the ninth hour, that's about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. You're like, what, what happened all of a sudden? That's Jesus' language of his day. Jesus didn't speak English. And so Jesus crying out in his language now, what translates into, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then some standing there heard this and they said, he's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again, another gospel writer tells us this second cry was the phrase, it is finished. When he cried out again, Jesus offered up or gave up his spirit. And then in verse 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The next section tells us that people came out of their graves when this happened in the vicinity of Jesus' death. And then if you'll drop down to verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. And then just speed up, if you will, to chapter 28. Jesus has been buried. The tomb has been guarded. And now, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. This is Easter. Jesus, the Son of God, crucified for the sins of the world. This is Easter. Jesus, the Son of God, dead and buried in a borrowed tomb. This is Jesus, guarded by the most powerful force on earth. This is Easter. Jesus, called from the dead by the voice of his Father, alive now, victorious over hell and over sin and over death and over the grave. This is Easter. The angel has moved the stone, not to let Jesus out, but to let us in to see where he lay. And this is the story of Easter. It is a story of resurrection from the dead. It is a story of victory over sin. It is a story of eternal life. But the question we're asking today is why? Why did Jesus die? 
Why was he buried in a borrowed tomb? Why was the stone rolled away? And why did Jesus come back in victorious, triumphant resurrection life? And the answer to that question today is staggering because the why of Easter is so that the God of all creation could have a relationship with you. And it is about an empty tomb, and we do celebrate that today. The Thompson family clings to that hope today. The Law family at Cumberland clings to that hope today. Brett Pinion, who we just had the celebration service for his wife Anne a few weeks ago at Cumberland, he clings to that hope today. Our family, Shelley's family, we cling to that hope today that Jesus is alive and Milton Graves is alive in him. And Easter is a story of mighty resurrection power. But the why to Easter is staggering today. And the reason Jesus died, the reason he was buried, the reason he was raised from the dead wasn't just so that we could come today and celebrate an empty tomb. The reason for Easter, the why behind Easter is because God, the God of all creation, wants to have a relationship with you. God is not simply interested in getting you to heaven when you die. He wants a relationship with you every single day that you live. But you have to come to God on his terms. This is the most interesting time to be alive because all of us are moving quickly to this moment and this place where everything happens on our terms. I'm good, I'm fine, I'm great just the way I am, and I wanna do everything in life on my terms. And I will let you know what my terms are, and I will live life on my terms. But I just wanna remind us all today, we're living in God's world, we're living on God's earth, we were created in the image of Almighty God, the breath that we breathe today came from the God who created us, and everything in the world doesn't happen on our terms, it all happens on God's terms. And, This amazing creator God who wants a relationship with you is gracious enough today to let you know that that relationship has to be on his terms. It's kind of like going to the masters. You go on their terms. Anybody been to the masters all of a sudden at Trillith? It's kind of like, it's a golf tournament. They have it in Augusta. I'm not sure somehow at Cumberland last night people knew about it, but maybe not at Trillith. Um, anybody been to the Masters in the last few days? Hello, a few people here. One person here. Okay, great. Not a big golf fan down at Passion City Church, Trillith. When you go to the Masters, you go on their terms. In other words, there are no fans at the Masters. They're patrons at the Masters. Nobody's pulling uh, behind them a Yeti cooler coming into the Masters. <laughs> it's not the way it works. This is a cut above, people. The dress is... Appropriate. I don't know what appropriate is, but it says on the website under the rules for the patrons, appropriate dress. And I guess people just figure that out. I'm not really wearing my Van Halen t-shirt, you know, to the masters. I'm gonna be appropriate. No trash is thrown at the masters. It's amazing to see 50,000 people show up at a sporting event and there is not one piece of trash on the ground. And if somehow one accidentally falls to the ground, a person coming behind will quickly pick it up and put it in the trash can because you come on their terms. You can't heckle the players at the masters. The Waste Management Championship in Phoenix, absolutely, appropriately named, by the way, was called the Wasted Management Championship. And you can go crazy. At the Masters, you can't run. Oh, you can be excited and walk really fast, but you cannot run. Can't bring a camera during play. And the most crazy thing of all, you cannot bring your phone. You leave that in the car. So think about that. 
all those cars parked at the Masters all got phones in them. And people say, okay. They know if I'm going to come and be a part of the tradition unlike any other, that I've got to come on the terms of the men and the women in the green jackets. That's how you come to the masters. You come on their terms. And when you come and accept this invitation into a relationship with the God of heaven who is glorious and perfect and righteous, you come on his terms. If you don't, then you don't come. We see that in the very beginning of our story, Genesis 3, everything has gone wrong. God has created paradise. It's called Eden, and in Eden, God is in relationship with Adam and Eve. So yes, they had a job to name animals and steward creation, and yes, it was perfect and beautiful, and they had each other, but the main thing about Eden was they were in fellowship with God. He didn't just make them and plunk them down on a rock and say, have a great life. He made them for relationship with himself. And he said, here's my terms. In this garden, you can have everything but one thing. Those are my terms. And this one thing will bring you death. So everything else is yours. This one thing is not. It will bring you death. These are my terms. And we see right from the beginning that he's a good God. We see right from the big beginning that he's not withholding anything from us. We see right from the beginning that he has our best interest in mind. We see right from the beginning that God is a God of love, but he also has terms. And the terms were everything except one thing. Well, what did Adam and Eve do? They did the very same thing you would have done. You say, I would not have done that. No, yes, you would have. Because we have a tendency to gravitate to the one thing, not everything. And when God says you can have it all but this, we go, what is this? Hmm, this? Hmm, interesting. What do you think that is? Why do you think we can't have that? What do you think he's trying to hide from us with this thing over here? And he's like, no, 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 everything. And we're like, I know, that's amazing, but this is interesting. And in the moment that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they died. Not physically, but spiritually. In that moment, sin entered into humanity with the tragic consequence of them being separated now from a holy God. As the story comes down at the end of chapter three, we see this, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and to take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. You say, well, what what does that mean exactly? It means now that Adam was in a state of being separated from God and spiritually dead, had he eaten from this tree again and lived forever, he would have lived forever separated from God and spiritually dead. And so as a result, the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim. Can you say that with me? Cherubim. What did he place there? Cherubim. And a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. One man on one day in one act brought separation for all men from a holy God. And God placed a cherubim there to say, you cannot come back and enter in to the tree of life. You may have never noticed that 
cherubim, but I want you to think about the cherubim today. This cherubim wasn't some sweet little angelic being who just sort of leaned on the east side gate of Eden and said, I'm so sorry, you're not gonna be able to come in today. This cherubim was fierce and ferocious, a flaming sword going back and forth to prevent humanity from stepping back into God's perfect place. And then Jesus now is hanging on the cross at three o'clock in the afternoon. He cries out, why have you forsaken me? Then he cries out again, it is finished. And then he gives up his life in death for you and me. And Matthew says the very first thing recorded after the death of Jesus was to see that what started in Eden now is being finished at Calvary. That when God put the cherubim at the eastern side of Eden, he had a plan. And the plan wasn't that man could go in and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and live eternally separated from God. God had a plan that he would make a way for man to be restored in relationship to a holy God. And that plan began to unfold in eternity, but now it's unfolding in real time in human history. And that plan leads to Jesus. That plan leads to the Son of God being born in Bethlehem and at his birth. It was said about him, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And now here he hangs on a cross. He says, why have you forsaken me, Father? And then he says, it is finished. And when he cries out and dies, Matthew says the very next thing that happened was that the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, now why is that recorded as the very first thing after the death of Jesus by three of the gospel accounts? Because this is the symbol of the separation of the cherubim in Eden, who said you cannot come into God's holy place, the curtain in the temple. Can we talk about it for a moment? In Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, a place where God's people had worshiped through the ages. And in this place of worship was the temple. And the temple had an outer court and an inner court, a holy place where the priest would minister. And then inside the holy place was the most holy place, the holy of holies. 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. A cubit being the length of someone's arm, so 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. And in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant of God. This chest containing the Ten Commandments covered with the mercy seat with two cherubim made of gold facing one another on top of the mercy seat. And this Ark represented God's presence among his people. It was the most holy place because it's where God said to Moses, this is where I will meet with you. But it was so holy, holy that if someone looked at it, they would die. And so a curtain was hung. The veil. The scriptures record that it was woven with skilled craftsmen, with threads of blue and purple and crimson and woven into the veil were cherubim. Just like Eden. Saying, these are my terms. Don't come in here or you will die. Because I, the Lord God Almighty, am holy. Only one day a year could one person go into the Holy of Holies. On the Day of Atonement, different from Easter time, Day of Atonement happening in the fall, the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant of God as a symbol of the people's remorse for their sins. It would happen year 
after year, after year, after year. And the people of God would fast and pray. The people of God would be sad for all the wrong that they had done. And the one man on the one day would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood on the ark and on the mercy seat. It was so treacherous that a rope was tied around the man in the event that he died in the presence of Almighty God, they would pull his body out under the veil. And on the fringe of his robe were small gold bells all around so that the priest in the holy place could hear the holy man moving and know He's still alive in the presence of a holy God. These are God's terms. And on the day that Jesus died, in the moment that he gave up his spirit, that veil This message was partly inspired by us being in Israel a few weeks ago. I mentioned it here to all the folks at Passion City Church a few weeks ago, that while we were there, we met an archeologist who's a renowned archeologist in the Holy Land, discovered some amazing things in the last 10 or 15 years. And he taken us to an active archeological site, a place right under a, a neighborhood just near the Temple Mount where the pilgrimage road has been excavated, this walkway where thousands and millions of pilgrims would have come up to the Temple Mount for the festivals and the feasts. And deep below ground, this roadway has been excavated and is being excavated to this day. And he took us down there and took us into this little place where they built a covering over the top and for a long way you walk up to the temple mount on this thousands year old pilgrimage road which has been down there underneath civilizations and he told us while we were there he said and, and I also found something else amazing in this area he goes we were excavating a drainage channel which came out of the Temple Mount and down along this way. And it would co collect water and storms and rain and it would collect waste and maybe some sewage that was put there by people. And we found the drainage ditch and began to excavate in it. And down below the layers in a drainage ditch, we found the only one of these things that's ever been found before from the time of Jesus. And he showed us this picture of what they had found. It's one of the little bells from the bottom of the robe. So tiny, when you see it in a human hand that it's not hard to understand how it could have come, become dislodged from the robe, moving through the crowd, and then maybe rolled or, or was kicked by someone to the side and then fell into the drainage ditch and I guess got stuck up against a rock or some debris that was there so that it wasn't washed along down the way. It just remained there over time and over centuries and over millennia until someone dug down through the rubble and found the one golden bell with its pomegranate engraving. And this archaeologist looked at us and said, it's the only thing on earth that we know of that may have actually been in the Holy of Holies. And I just 
need you to know today that that is God sifting down through the rubble to say, check this out. And to let this bell, this bell actually still rings. They did some testing on it and some infrared imaging and can see the little clapper inside of it and how it works. And I thought it does still ring and it's still ringing today. The bells of Easter and a holy God are still tolling today. And the bell rings for you and the bell rings for me. And what is that little bell saying today? A few things that you've got to walk out with today. Number one, it's saying that God is determined to get to you. And he is determined to get you to him. The second thing that little bell is saying today is that the way was made by God. God has made the way. Easter has a why. And what is the why to Easter? God wants to have a relationship with you. You say, well, how does that happen? If it's got to be on his terms, how does it happen? Here's how it happens. God makes the way. Heaven makes the way to heaven. God makes the way to God. God is not saying to you today, hey, you've messed your life up and here's how you now have to make a way to me. God is saying, when my son died, I made the way and I showed you I made the way by ripping that veil in two and saying, you now can walk into the holy place to the mercy seat of almighty God and you can see the mercy seat and live. God made the way. They worshiped in this temple, by the way, for decades after Jesus died. Eventually, Jerusalem was destroyed and this temple was destroyed. But for decades, they still worshiped there. Someone's job was to either make a new veil or to repair that one. And I can't think of a worse job than being the person tasked with sewing back the veil that God himself had torn in two. You know, some people love their religious system more than the grace of God. And what God is saying today is I made a way, the system is finished. And I'm making a new way. Yes, it's on my terms because I'm a holy God, but my terms of holiness are satisfied in the death of my son. And you can now come through my son and have a relationship with a holy God. Mercy and grace and holiness wed on God's terms. I've shared this story before, but a few years back, we, Shelly and I went to the masters, a tradition unlike any other. And we went with a former champion of the masters. And so we drove down Magnolia Lane and parked uh, where the champions park and walked through the clubhouse and eventually out to the first tee. And we're standing on the first tee watching our friend tee off for uh, the opening round. And as he's teeing off, Shelly just slightly lifts her phone up and takes a photograph of him. A phone that she has because we came down Magnolia Lane and we didn't come through a metal detector and nobody, you know, searched us and made us take stuff out of our pockets and it, she just had the phone. And so she's just like, and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and then I turn and right here is one of the members, green jacket, who's in charge of the first tee. And we're this close together. tapping Shelly. She turns. And just very quietly, miraculously, we, we had met this man a few weeks before at a dinner. Praise God. <laughs> and he said very calmly, Shelly, please put the phone down. She's like, And 
And I'm like, oh no. Because if you have a phone, you get kicked out. And being a good husband, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what you do in Augusta Bay, but you'll be good. I'll see you at 7 30. And he, um, he just very quietly says, um, please. He, he knew how we'd come in. He said, and it's just, you know, right back there. He goes, please go and put the phone away. It's like, thank you, God. Mercy. Their terms, but with mercy. The little bell is ringing today. God made the way. He's still just. Look at the cross. He is still righteous. Look at the cross. He is still perfect. Look at the cross. But he is a God of mercy. The veil has been torn. And two, and that little bell ringing today is telling you that Jesus was forsaken by God so that you never will have to be forsaken. In an instant, there was a cherubim keeping Jesus from the tree of life. A cherubim saying to Jesus, out of Eden forsaken and cut off so that you could be accepted and grafted in. It was God's way. Jesus did not die, interestingly, on the day of atonement. You would think that would have made total sense, right? The day that we go in and sprinkle on the altar every single year would be the day that Jesus would die one time for all time so that the demands of God would be satisfied. But Jesus didn't die on the Day of Atonement. Jesus died on Passover, by the way, which is this weekend. We know exactly when Passover is. So that God could say, it's not a holy man doing something once a year. It's Almighty God offering His perfect Son. as a final sacrifice. And lastly, that little bell ringing today, what it's telling us is, is that God wants a relationship with us. John 17, three, this is the way Jesus said it. And this is eternal life, that you may know him, the one true God, and that you may know Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. This is eternal life. And this is Easter. Yes, we want to know that there's life after death. Yes, we want to know that the grave is not our final resting place. Yes, we want to know that the tomb is empty and the stone is rolled away and heaven is our future. But this is not the story, people. God's not interested in just getting you to heaven when you die. God is passionate about a relationship with you every single moment of your life. And this is what the bell tolls for today. It is about knowing God, about being in relationship through Jesus with a holy God. And I wonder if anybody today wants to accept that invitation and walk through the torn veil of the finished work of Jesus and come into a relationship with holy God, knowing that through Jesus you can be forgiven, washed clean, made new, and find mercy. It's on God's terms. So today, the invitation is not do your best. The invitation is not try harder. The invitation is not, oh, you'll never make it. The invitation is like, you should just give up. The invitation isn't come to church more, do more good things, try to clean your life up. That's not God's terms. God's terms are my son was enough. Come through Jesus. 
come through the shed blood of Jesus. Come through the finished work of Jesus. Come through his death. Come through his burial. Come through his resurrection and find the gift of eternal life and a relationship with Almighty God. I love how this centurion said what we've been saying today. I have witnessed it. Matthew records it. The veil is torn. An earthquake splits rocks. Dead people come out of their tombs. And then the soldiers who've been guarding Jesus, they are terrified and they proclaim, surely this man is the son of God. I love it that God Almighty at the finished work of the cross did not need a sermon or a song. He didn't need a church service. Right at the foot of the cross of Jesus, heaven gave revelation sight. Men who had persecuted Jesus and only cared about getting a paycheck on this day, their eyes were open. They saw who he truly was and they worshiped him right in that moment as the son of God. They had revelation sight. And today, that Easter bell is ringing. Mm. 